I'm Scarlett Food. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ, where we focus on the access risks and rewards offered by exchange traded funds. It's deja vu all over again with 2019's everything rally stretching into 2020. But what about the inevitable downturn? BlackRock goes green. The fund manager is putting climate change at the center of its strategy. So what happens to the trillions of passive dollars tied to indexes? And MedTech is the new safe haven with healthcare front and center this election year. We profile an ETF that offers growth and safety. Now, the ETF industry has its fans and critics, but there's no getting around the product's influence, partly because they can foretell bigger trends in the market. Eric Bautrinas is our resident ETF flow reader, and he gives us his take right now. What do you see? Thank you, Scarlett. Um, A lot of the same, and I sound like a broken record, but this is what the flows are telling me. Everybody is loving life right now. Look at the top two, SPY and IVV, that's S&P 500. Uh, TLT, that shows you people don't fear rates because that's long-dated treasuries. XLF, people buying into those good bank earnings there. Also, BKLN's kind of interesting. Gunlock was asked on a webcast where you can get good yield as a retiree, and he just plugged BKLN, and boom, that moved the needle for a bunch of hundreds of millions of flows. So uh, kudos to him for that. Uh, Let's look at outflows. Um, GLD leading to me is exactly the opposite of this. So it completes that risk on picture because GLD is the top. Also seeing small caps to large caps. That's back to large caps and also IWD's value out of value into growth. So again, we're back to that whole trade. Uh, Let's look at traders versus allocators. And this is also interesting because these ETFs that are used for risk on are being bought by both mom and pop and institutions and traders three months in a row. And look how rare that is. Nothing has spooked the easily spooked traders. And I find that remarkable that there's just nothing to complain about and we're seeing it in the flows. Yeah, the everything rally clearly lives on. Let's bring in Doug Bonaparte. He is president and founder of Bonafide Wealth, which has almost $100 million in AUM. And Annie Massa, our Bloomberg News reporter who covers the asset management industry. Doug, let me start with you. Uh, The everything rally lives on. And you've got a tactical portfolio that only holds securities trading above their 200-day moving average. So I take it then that you're fully invested right now. Yeah, everything's fully in the market at the moment. And what are you doing in terms of looking at the allocations that you could be making down the road, or it's only going to happen once we start to see any kind of sustained downturn? Yeah, this is pretty fixed into place until we start seeing things come back down and start moving positions out of the market. But, you know, everything's been in. I think the shortest was 59 or 60 days going now. Mm -hmm. So it's been a couple months of not having to pull any triggers in the portfolio. We'll see how far that can go. Let's talk about the reciprocal, because if everything goes up, right, called the everything up rally, 2018 showed us everything go down. Yeah. Um, How do you hedge then if gold and treasuries, let's say they don't work, uh, what goes on then? Uh, How do you deal with uh, that situation? So it's important to remember that the tactical portfolio is not the core portfolio for clients. This is added to as a satellite to um, a very conventional, you know, long only portfolio that's commensurate Mm -hmm. with the risk that the client wants to take. So 80, 20, 60, 40, stuff like that. So I wouldn't view this as, oh my God, I'm going to be out of the market on all of my money. This is just a little piece that we hope over the long term, keeping that long term theme adds a little bit of firepower to their overall returns. Got it. Now, Annie, the other big story of this week is BlackRock. Yes, it announced earnings, but CEO Larry Fink really made a splash with his annual letter that addresses climate change. What exactly is BlackRock saying and doing? That's right. Fink made a big statement on climate change in his CEO letter, which was a first for him in in this particular forum. And he announced in tandem with that letter plans for BlackRock to incorporate climate change considerations into all these different parts of its business. That affects both active and passive strategies, although passive strategies are a bit tougher to incorporate. Yeah, speaking of that, so if you are an ETF investor, Doug, as you are, you own ITOT, Mm -hmm. um, that means you're sort of saying, well, is how is he going to vote? Because they can't sell out of the stocks, but they can vote. How important is, is it to you and your clients as an investor in iShares for Larry Fink, BlackRock, Vanguard and such to vote in a certain way? Do you care? I don't think at the retail level it matters as much maybe at the institutional level where you have, you know, basically more dollars at play. We're looking for our clients to be disciplined in what they do. That is the most important thing for us. And staying invested according to their strategies is ultimately all that matters. Voting secondary, maybe tertiary from there on. 
And you brought this up, Annie, but I really wonder, because critics say that BlackRock is basically committing to voluntary virtue. It can talk the talk, but when two-thirds of its $7 trillion of assets are stuck in passive funds, are over which it has no control over, right? Because the index compilers uh, have oversight on that. What difference does a green commitment really make here? That's right. When it comes to passive funds like ETFs, it's really a different story than simply the discretion that an active manager can use selling out of a certain kind of fund. When it comes to ETFs and index products, you're tethered to the index. So so the, the ideas are a little bit more hazy. Mm -hmm. BlackRock did say that it will put forward um, some ideas to the index providers, pressuring them for change and for more sustainable indexes that they can link products to, for example, and introducing on its own end more ESG ETFs. Now, even if BlackRock's voting might not move the needle or, or you know, clients aren't that interested, we did talk a little bit about how in sectors you like tech and you don't like energy, you're bearish on energy. That seems kind of like in tune with everything we're talking about here. Can you talk about that going into the next decade? Do you still like that? Because yeah. that was a great trade this decade. Sure. And I think it's it's pretty short-sighted if you believe that technology will not continue to you know fuel our economy, global economies. I don't know what era you're living in to think otherwise, mm -hmm. but tech for the win for the long term. And energy has a bit of personal, you know, never really done personally well in that space. Um, I don't think fossil fuels necessarily are going to be the ticket moving forward. You know, not to pull Tesla into the conversation, but you can see a lot of excitement around alternate, you know, ways of fueling things, namely cars there. Why right. does that not spread, you know, throughout the way we power the world? And just talk a little bit. You have young clients. I call you guys, your advisors like you, the big long. Because uh -huh. no matter what happens, you guys just stick in it. Because we see it in the flows. Every little blip, the, it, the investors have stuck to right. uh, their investments. Just talk about that. And is it just young people or are all of your investors hanging in and ignoring some of these headlines that we see? I think it has to do with where the risk is placed. And for my clients, typically in your late 30s, it's around income risk, not asset price risk. We're in accumulation phase. Mm -hmm. If you can keep income uh, flowing in, in a downturn, in a steep pullback, that's an opportunity to deploy dry powder or shift out of fixed income into equities. How, how is that not an opportunity to buy low? The big risk is if the income faucet turns off. That's why we like having large cash reserves. Right. That's like we, we like doing planning to make sure that we can ride out those situations, which I think are the worst situations financially for young investors. And that would be why buy the dip continues to work as Absolutely. it has been over the past couple of years. Our thanks to Douglas Bonaparte of Bonafide Wealth and Bloomberg's Annie Massa, who covers BlackRock and asset managers. Now, coming up, Ken Natal, Chief Investment Officer of Black Diamond Wealth Management, is joining us. He digs into this year's launch of active ETFs that don't disclose their holdings on a daily basis. And one fund that caught our attention, the United States oil ETF, ticker USO. Almost $300 million flowed into USO last week, the biggest weekly gain since February of 2016. It's typical for investors to use this fund to make bets on short-term price reversals and buy in when oil is falling. A reminder, by the way, that you can find that and all the other charts that we feature on Bloomberg at GTV Go. This is ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Food. This is ETF IQ. Let's take you through the ETF life cycle, which has three main stages. Step one is always the filing. U.S. Commodity Funds registers the U.S. CF Energy Strategy Absolute Return Fund. Ticker USE will invest in energy-related derivative instruments, such as those based on oil, petroleum, and nat gas. The actively managed fund may also target futures based on clean energy. Step two is the launch. A pair of iShares begin trading this week. The iShares Factors U.S. Growth Style ETF and the iShares Factors U.S. Value Style ETF. They'll invest in mid and large caps using a growth or value style factor, track Russell indexes, and charge 25 basis points. And for some, the final stage is liquidation. Say goodbye to the Pickens Morningstar Renewable Energy Response ETF. RENW targets U.S. and Canadian companies that are leaders in the transition to a low carbon economy. This ETF was actually restructured in August from the NYSE Pickens Oil Response ETF, ticker Boone, but it wasn't enough to attract investor interest. 
All right, let's get passive aggressive and track the tensions between active and passive investing. Active managers may get their turn to shine in 2020 because this year we'll see the launch of several active ETFs that don't disclose their holdings daily. Ken Nuttall, CIO at Black Diamond Wealth Management, is excited about this development and joins us now to explain why. So you are a registered investment advisor. You use ETFs and you're excited about the arrival of what we call active non-transparents. Explain to us, first of all, how you use active and passive ETFs in your portfolio. How do you mix them up? We use both in our portfolios. Uh, we are big users as financial planners. We take a look at clients' goals and try to figure out an investment strategy that gets them to their, their, their place using the right kind of risk uh, on it. And we use both the index and the active out there. And we like actives a lot, especially in certain areas such as fixed income, because we think there's where a lot of value can happen uh, out, out there. But you know, we've we used a lot of these, usually in mutual funds, but one of the struggles we've had in the past is sometimes of capital gains that the mutual funds pass mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the ETF wrapper, you typically don't have that, and that's one of the reasons we're excited about it. The other reason is, you know, and there's no, no commission trade world this, these days <laughs> on ETFs, you know, it's kind of hard when you're p purchasing uh, mutual funds for $20 when you buy a similar ETF for zero. Okay, so uh, the cost is a big part of it. Let's talk specifically then about T. Rowe Price, which have released the pricing of their active non-transparents. Yep. What's the appeal here for the ETF version of these particular funds? So we we have used the, the T. Rowe Price uh, funds in the past, mm -hmm. and, you know, we like them because they have a good process, they have a good track record. You know, they, they tell you they're going to do one thing, and they actually do do it. You know, but the reason why we, we haven't used them overly these these uh, last few years is just because of the capital gains. I think last year some of their their, their funds that are moving over paid between two to seven percent in capital gains. And clients, you know, most of our clients don't like paying taxes, yeah. so if we can avoid that using an ETF wrapper, we want to do that. Okay, so tax consideration is certainly a big factor yeah. here, but the backdrop is that active equity funds, mutual funds, have seen 30 quarters of net outflows. It's yeah. you know pretty entrenched here. As these active firms launch ETFs of their funds, how critical does the track record really become? Because I would expect that a lot of um, underperforming active funds will also get turned into ETFs as well. Uh, that's true. You're going to have the underactive, uh, underperforming ones also turned into, into it. But you know what you kind of look at, like we look at it from a client's point of view as the risk that a fund is, is adding or taking into the, the portfolio. So not all funds are actually trying to shoot to you know beat the S&P 500. You know we want you know like an active equity income fund. You know if something mm. out there from T Rowe pays like a three three and a half percent but we also get the ability to get some growth on it. Mm -hmm. A person who's coming close to retirement would actually kind of like that in their portfolio. So it just gives you more flexibility to yes. match um, the product with someone's goals. All right, let's talk about direct indexing because some have called it an ETF killer. You're pretty open-minded. It's something that you're willing to adopt yeah. as well. Explain, first of all, the difference between direct indexing and an ETF. Yeah, so direct indexing is basically buying the underlying constituents of the index. So for the S&P 500, that can be buying portions of the S&P 500. You don't have to buy all 500 stocks. The math says about between 200 to 250 of those stocks will give you a up close approximation to what the, the uh, S&P can do. Okay, so you said you can buy portions of the S&P 500. Once you start doing that, isn't that just a form of active and you could underperform as we've seen you, much of active uh, equity funds do? And Direct indexing, because it's more costly, and if you underperform, won't clients scream about that? Uh, yeah, it, it could. You definitely have to. You have to make sure that your tracking error is very close to what the S&P is. But one of the benefits that we get out of doing direct indexing is the tax loss harvesting. Mm. So now instead of having one asset, such as the SP, SPY, now you have you know, 200, 250 in my example. And you know, last year, even though the market was up 29%, you know, there was still 20% of the index that was actually down, right. which giving you some opportunity to take the tax loss off. Okay, so you have more opportunity to harvest tax losses, but don't you run out of losses? I mean, the S&P well, 500 is up 30%. Yeah, well, eventually you can, uh -huh. uh, you know, but that's down the road. You know, if you use the SPY, you only have one chance of, of taking a tax loss. If you have 200 constituents, you can, you know, have many more chances. We were talking earlier about BlackRock going green. You use iShares ETFs a lot. Yep. What do you think about BlackRock's pledge to be more conscious about climate change and shifting its investment approach? It, it's one of the questions that we get a lot from clients is about ESG. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem that we have found with ESG is that one person's E is not another person's E. Yeah. And we, you know, we kind of use direct indexing sometimes for this because, like, it's one person doesn't want fossil fuels, one person doesn't want guns. You can actually kind of do that in the direct indexing. 
But with the BlackRock coming out with more suite of the ESG, I've actually gotten a, a few phone calls today saying, hey, when are you going to put these into your portfolio? So it's definitely something that's on top of the mind for many investors. Okay, so people are ready to dive in and take a look and yeah. see what these funds are actually made of then. Yeah, and you know, they, they got to realize that you might underperform the indexes there. And we need to make sure that people understand that. But if you take out fossil mm. fuels and fossil fuels have a great year, you will underperform. Important points there. Ken, Ken Nuttall of Black Diamond Wealth Management, great to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, coming up, healthcare will be center stage during the 2020 election cycle. So we dig into an ETF that takes a look at one part of this sector. And for a drill down into all of our ETF content, check out Bloomberg.com slash markets slash ETFs. This is ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. This is ETF IQ. Now, for every ETF that offers exposure to an asset class or sector, others are usually quick to follow suit. The business of mining uranium has not given investors much in the way of returns in recent years. Will that change as climate change prompts policy action? North Shore Indices is counting on rising demand for nuclear power, which relies on uranium. Tim Rotolo, the firm's founder and CEO, is here with us. Now, before we talk to him, Eric Boutrinas is going to give us the drill down into North Shore's fund. Thank you, Scarlett. Yeah, URNM. It's, it's brand new. It's only a month old, but uh, it's very small. So if you use a new fund, obviously you want to use a limit order. But the goal of this fund is to track uranium companies, mostly the miners, though. So here we are at the holdings. Um, and these top three companies here, all totally uranium mining. Some mining ETFs will have diversified miners, but this is pretty pure. And that's really the differentiating factor with this new uranium mining ETF is to get as close to the price of uranium as possible and go further. That means more volatility. So let's look at a tail of the tape between this one and URA, which is the existing one, and also uh, NLR, which is the other one. Now, URA is very old, nine years, pretty sizable, given the performance has been, like, awful. But here's the big difference. Look at the percent mining companies. 75 for the new one here, 45 for URA, and 4 for this. These will be a little less volatile, but this should pop more if uranium goes up. A little pricier, too. So that's generally what you're getting here. But again, it's a fresh new ETF, so, uh, you know, beware, limit orders, uh, but this is a fascinating issue that uh, we could hear more about in the future. All right. Good stuff, Eric. Now, still with us is Tim Rotolo of North Shore Indices. And let's talk a little bit about this idea of a new uranium ETF. Why did you decide to launch one? Because Eric mentioned uh, the not-so-great performance. It's pretty yep. miserable, actually, uh, for the past decade, if you look at URA. Uh, the back test for URNM, I'm guessing, can't be that much better. So what's the investment case right now? Yeah, so uh, you know, over the last couple of years, um, the domain expert who, uh, who oversees the fund with me, Mike Alkin, has put together a thesis that I just think sets uranium up as one of the most asymmetric investment opportunities in the market. So candidly, I, I hadn't even thought about it as a back test. I mean, we, we just knew that the market's been in a bear market for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. um, the fundamentals are continuing to set up incredibly favorably. Uh, so demand growth from nuclear utilities is very, very robust. We think it's going to grow up 2% for the next decade. And on the supply side, we think that there's a supply deficit forming. And so, you know, from my perspective as a generalist investor, when I thought about investing in uranium, I saw URA had basically changed their index in 2018. And so that created an opportunity where there was no longer a way for investors to access this opportunity set. And so we decided to set out and create the index. We all also wanted to tilt it towards junior miners mm -hmm. um, because we think that that's where the real operating leverage is in this, in this opportunity. There's an op-ed this month in the Wall Street Journal talking about how nuclear energy can save the planet. Uh, climate scientists, write the author of this book, tell us that the world must drastically cut its fossil fuel use in the next three decades to stave off potential catastrophe. Confronting the challenge is a moral issue, yes, uh, but it's also a math problem, and a big part of the solution has to be nuclear power. The problem, though, Tim, is public perception. Chernobyl Three Mile Island, Fukushima. How much will it take to change the perception that nuclear is not safe? I'm not sure it's going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think that's actually what's one of the, the opportunities in this sector is that the public perception is so negative. And actually, there was a Pew, uh, Pew Foundation poll which showed uh, the favorability of nuclear is akin to coal and, uh, and, and other dirty fuels and, and fossil fuels, whereas wind and solar are incredibly favorable. It's, you know, 96, 97 percent favorability. So I, I think the actual opportunity is that 
we're starting to see that shift. Yeah. And so actually the change of direction of the sentiment is going to be very positive. And we've already started to see that as nuclear demand growth has accelerated over the last few years. And then real quick, you have this other ETF called Dual yes. that only tracks companies that have dual share class listings, which ESG people aren't really hot about Correct. because it gives too much control. What's the logic there? Uh, so again, we, you know, we, we see that there's a, a void in the market, no different than private lenders who moved into uh, non-bank lending after Dodd-Frank. Uh, the index providers like S&P have said they're not going to provide or not allow dual share class companies into the S&P 500 and other indices that they manage. We think that there's an opportunity oh. to provide access to dual share class companies, which when you look at you know, a, a more favorable back test, have done exceptionally well. Um, and we think it's actually um, somewhat antithetical to the capital markets to exclude investors to be able to, uh, to be able not to be able to invest in companies like a Google or a Facebook. So, you know, if, if you're truly trying to democratize access to in capital markets, I think we have to be able to provide a, an investment solution to investors to have access to those dual share class companies, which have been some of the most prolific growth companies of the last decade. Tim Rotolo of North Shore Indices, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. Now, the ETF industry has something for everyone, including those worried an economic slowdown is on the horizon. In this week's There's an ETF for That, we show you one fund that could provide some shelter. It's been called a port in the storm and a safe haven for investors. The iShares U.S. Medical Devices ETF, also known by its ticker IHI, tracks U.S. healthcare companies that make and distribute equipment and supplies. IHI is considered less vulnerable to the U.S.-China trade war and even this year's U.S. presidential election, where healthcare is likely to be front and center. That's despite its biggest companies trading close to their highest earnings multiples in years. IHI has attracted some $5 billion in assets, has an expense ratio of 43 basis points, and weights its almost 60 holdings by market cap. As a result, major players crowd the top of the fund, names including Abbott Labs, Medtronic, Thermo Fisher, and Danaher. IHI returned more than 30% in 2019, outpacing the overall market and the healthcare select sector spider ETF, its larger, cheaper, and broader competitor. IHI gets a green light in the Bloomberg Intelligence traffic light system. Yeah, an analyst recently called IHI a good safe haven. Yeah, and it's all, the performance is amazing. Uh, we had Gary Stringer saying that pharma gets beat up in Congress, yes. but devices don't. They get a, a free pass. They get spared, and the performance <laughs> is there, and everyone gets to reap it. All right, that does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. Be sure to catch us each Wednesday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. From New York, this is Bloomberg.